Welcome to the Aurelius Podcast. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder and CEO here at Aurelius and your host for the show. This episode, we have the spark that started the global movement of research ops, Kate Towsey. Kate started this global open source community to define, discuss, and answer the question, what is research ops? Kate is also the research operations lead at Atlassian. She has quite an interesting background and probably not the one you'd expect or guess as to how she ended up doing what she is now. With experience and background in content strategy, she began working in early technology companies in the early days of the internet. As with many of us, she sort of backed into this role in UX and research. Eventually, Kate was asked to help in a new role which commissioned her to quote unquote research the researchers. Through this project, she had the opportunity to do user research with user research professionals. Very meta, but also very cool. Through this work, Kate began to realize her passion and interest in user research, but more specifically, helping researchers do their work more effectively. She shared quite a few interesting findings she uncovered through examining user researchers and their work. I know you're going to find it fascinating. Beyond that, Kate and I obviously had an in-depth chat about research ops, the global community and workshops, as well as what they found. It's an awesome effort and story that I'm sure you'll take away some great nuggets to apply to your own work and team. Now, of course, in discussing research ops, Kate and I got on to the topic of user research repositories or libraries. She had an interesting set of insights on how and why folks are using those as part of their research ops and overall UX research process. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job very well if I didn't mention that our product, Aurelius, is a user research repository for UX research and product teams. Aurelius helps you tag, organize, search, and share all your user research data and key insights in one place. So if you're looking to start using a user research repository, you should check us out at Aurelius. Head over to our website for a 14-day free trial or get in touch. I'm happy to answer any questions personally. I'd love to hear from you. Let's get to it with this week's episode, Kate Towsey. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 33, with special guest Kate Towsey. She's the instigator and founder of the Global Research Ops community, as well as the research operations leader at Atlassian. Kate, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. We've been waiting, uh, we've been waiting some time to have you on here. And uh, I know I'm personally excited to have this chat with you. And um, yes, we're excited to talk about all things research and research ops with you. <laughs> and it's quite funny because I see you're drinking a glass of wine and I'm having my morning cup of tea. Yeah, well, that's, that has nothing to do with the time, time zone difference. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, you're not supposed to give away the secrets of what makes the podcast great. <laughs> I'm very boring uh, uh, in person. <laughs> All right, Kate, um, I want to start off by, by just asking you, as I do with a lot of our guests, in the event if somebody's not you know, familiar with you and your work, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and, and some things that you're, you're doing today. Yeah, uh, so it's quite funny because uh, a short time ago, I, I did a talk at a bank here in Sydney, and um, they asked me the same question, and, and I, I said, do you want the long story or the short story? Because it is quite a long story. But I've uh, since then trained to give the very short story. I've had a pretty checkered career. But um, in 2004, a friend of mine uh, who was building an Amazon-like business for uh, selling books from India, actually, uh, I remember, I won't forget the, the, the day he introduced me to the web and we were kind of laying down on our belly and uh, on looking at this laptop. And he said, this is what the web looks like behind the front end. And he hired me to... Um, uh, work on customer services and kind of look after these uh, systems are based on OS Commerce for him. And um, soon enough, I was kind of reworking the system and uh, working on content. And uh, year, many years later, I discovered that really what I was doing was content strategy. Um, at some point, for various reasons, I, I moved to the UK in 2007 and got a job with another a company using the same system and a whole string of events kind of happened that one day I kind of ended up working with a design company um, who I had never heard of content strategy and they looked at me and they said uh, you're like a content strategist and it was just like 2008 when Christine Halverson had bought her out content strategy for the web and I just thought oh my gosh I've kind of found my home here 
and uh, ended up doing that work freelance for quite a while. And in about 2012, I met Lisa Reichelt, um, who hired me to work with her as a content strategist on a university website. And we just kind of loved working together and got on so well. And uh, she uh, later, and it was kind of probably my, my first very real introduction to user research professional level, you know, not kind of, we're going to kind of make it up as we go along. And uh, soon after, she asked me to come and work at GDS and uh, build out a, 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 a repository, basically, for the for the researchers. And um, as a content strategist, that seemed like a pretty logical thing to be doing. And uh, when I got there, I realized just how significant that job was. And it's sort of, what, uh, 2000 and gosh, it's six, seven years later now, and I'm still working on that, that problem <laughs> and, and intend on getting it right here. Um, but in the meantime, she said to me, you know, we, we actually also need a, a user research lab. And I kind of looked at her and I said, you, you do know that I have know very little about research labs. Um, I actually haven't even been into one ever. Um, long story short, I, I built a, a research lab for GDS. And uh, the irony was I ended up working with like 40 of the best researchers kind of out there. Um, and having to research the researchers and needing to, while I was researching these phenomenal researchers, I mean, like top grade, learn how to do research really well <laughs> by watching them and uh, kind of emulating them and, and figuring out what I was doing. Um, but I learned over those four years, three, it's sort of three years that I contracted with GDS and with uh, other clients at the same time, BBC and various people. Um, and learned a lot about not just what researchers need from a tools perspective, but the kinds of pressures and emotions that are on researchers as they're going through their work. And also, importantly, as the industry changes around them and how it receives research, the kinds of stresses and, and um, issues that are on researchers change and the opportunities there as well. Um, so that's kind of how I ended up in this position of knowing a whole lot about researchers and their tools and processes and having this real passion, um, kind of bizarre passion for research operations. That is fascinating. And, and because part of what I was going to ask you too, Kate, was how did you come into, to, how did you come into this passion of uh, caring a lot about the operations of research, research ops, mm -hmm. as we might say it. And, and I think that answers it pretty well. And uh I mean, if I were to summarize too, very much sort of backed into, uh, you know, what we would call user research and perhaps research ops now. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, you know, to add to that, I'm hiring at the moment. I'm, I'm looking for a research coordinator at Atlassian um, to be my first kind of team member to work with me on, these, on, on this wonderful opportunity and the challenges. And uh, I'm, I'm finding it interesting in, in the applications I get because a lot of people are, you know, sort of people trying to get into the industry and, and especially for a name like Atlassian, seeing research operations as kind of a doorway uh, position to get to where they really want to be, which is a, a researcher. And I was saying to our recruiter yesterday, you know, you really have to be someone who wants to create space for others to do their best work. And you're not focused on you doing your best work. And it sort of dawned on me then that maybe that's just kind of um, what I like to do because the community is sort of that way as well. I, I like to think and I hope um, that uh, it's creating a space for other people to really kind of express themselves and do their best work. So, you know, it was many years across various clients and, and industry listening to, you know, I got to know researchers' friends and, uh, you know, lots of coffees and chats in the hallway. And I seem to have a personality where people just like to share things with me, oftentimes even secrets, and then they'll be like, please don't tell anyone. Um, but um, I started to realize that, that researchers really had, like, as human beings, just stressed out, um, you know, sometimes even saying, you know, I'm on the verge of an emotional breakdown or even taking off days of work because the amount of pressure on them was just too much. So my interest in this comes from a really human angle, um, from just having had a lot of friends in the industry or people that I've gotten to know as colleagues who have been battling with their work and feeling like they weren't able to tick all the boxes and really wanting to be able to tick those boxes. Mm -hmm. And so my want uh, is to kind of offer that support because I know that those kind of 60, 70 researchers I've spent time speaking to are very likely indicative of the rest of the industry. Sure. Wow. That's great. I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so let's, uh, I don't know if it's fast forwarding, but I'm going to ask like very specific question. When did you decide that you wanted to more formalize this passion of yours, right? And, and really create the community. So 
I mean, you are certainly the instigator of the research ops community, right? Uh, when did that instigating actually happen for you? So it's, I can actually remember the moment. I think decide is quite a strong word. It was just a spontaneous idea. Um, but I say spontaneous, a little bit like when people become like overnight success or something, right? Nothing's overnight. If I look back now, I realize what was happening over the years, um, people had gotten to know about the work that I was doing at GDS, mostly through their, you know, the blog that I was um, running there. And uh, so a lot of very big companies were getting in touch just to have a conversation. And I always think it's funny because you say a big company, but I really know it's like one person in that company who's really interested in what you're doing and they get in touch. And so, you know, um, Etsy or Airbnb or, uh, you know, kind of 18F or whoever, somebody from one of those companies would get in touch and say, hey, we've got a similar problem and I'd love to chat to you about your work and what you're doing. And so I had these pretty regular one hour conversations um, with someone about a panel or about a lab technology or about running a, an editorial program for researchers or kind of training or whatever the story might be. And um, I started to realize over time, gosh, yeah, you know, just why am I having these conversations over and over again? And I don't mind having them, but it just feels like it feels like we're on a treadmill with it. We're really not actually going anywhere with this. And it's obviously a need. And um, why not? we all get together in a room and talk about it as a team, right? Uh, and I, I really, at the time, thought, well, I'm going to start the Slack channel. And I was convinced at that point that very few people were really interested in operations for research and that really I was one of a handful of geeks in the world who actually cared about this. And I remember even the previous year, that November, I'd done a talk on my research on researchers and particularly how researchers think about the things they make and collect. And I was convinced before I did the talk that it was going to bore everybody to death because <laughs> no one's interested in this stuff. And I've been proven very much wrong. I started the Slack thinking, you know, I got the kind of figurative pack of six pack of beers in the corner thinking maybe six <laughs> of us will arrive and and that'll be very nice. And we would have a nice conversation and we could possibly like make a framework or do something or go somewhere with it all. And I opened the doors wide open because I really kind of thought, you know, I'd have to beg people to come in the door. <laughs> And as we now know, um, you know, um, sort of uh, it started start in March. So what are we, uh, what's seven, eight months later now? I'm sort of not counting, but uh, something like that. First, I opened it in March and it's now a thousand something people. Mm -hmm. And every month I add another 150 or 200 people. Um, and uh, there's a, a big team now, a team of 60 plus uh, organizers behind the community called Team Reops. And there's a board of uh, sort of that we're forming at the moment, six or seven of us um, who are really there to kind of uh, share um, share some of the kind of standard uh, repetitive work behind the community because that certainly exists, um, but also be kind of in charge of the vision and the, and and the curate the message and and curate what we're really talking about here. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there was a couple things that you said in there that I want to I, I want to zero in on. The one, actually, the talk that you mentioned, because I think it's fascinating work researching the researchers, right? Uh, and we tend to be a pretty self-reflective bunch anyway. So I have to ask, I mean, in that work that you did, any big takeaways that you can share uh, mm -hmm. from researching the researchers? Yeah, loads. Uh, it was, a, I think, a half an hour talk or something. But um, this was very much on... Um, how researchers collate their assets um, or um, the stuff that they make uh, and what the, just the kind of thinking behind that is. And I did a, a whole lot of research around this at GDS because, as I mentioned, I was brought in really to look at what we do with our knowledge. Um, what I learned out of that research was that researchers are empathetic human beings. Uh, well, most people just are empathetic, not even just researchers, but particularly empathetic usually. And when it comes to research, they um, they generally want to speak to someone about what they learned or what they did. They want to hear the story behind it. They almost want to do an interview with them to understand what happened in that research. Very few researchers that I spoke to, if any, actually um, said that they were happy to read a research report and actually do something with it and base their research work on, uh, it doesn't matter how good it was, you know, they would need to kind of really kind of feel it and understand it to be able to go out and and do something more with it. And so because of that, even if they could find the research reports, 
um, they might read them and then still go and do the research all over again because they needed to feel like they were in the weeds of it and understood it for themselves. Um, so what I did realize out of that, that repos are really bus terminals. They're not places where, they're not libraries, right? A library you kind of go into on your own and you pick a book out and you take it home and you read it and you enjoy it and you put it back on the shelf. Repos are much more around, um, I'm going to go and find out when did this research happen, who did it, who was on the team, what demographic, all the kinds of details around, like a bus terminal, where's the bus going, how many stops has it got, how much does it get there and who's on it, um, so that I can contact the person or someone who was on that team to speak to them about it. Mm -hmm. And along with that, the research report gives them some context for that conversation and whether it's a valid conversation for them to have or not. So in some ways, that's um, hypothetical at that point, because the irony is I, didn't, I did a lot of experimentation around video data um, at GDS eventually for, for uh, other reasons, and I still think it's very valid work. Um, but I didn't actually, because of that, then get time to build out a repo. You know, it's interesting how uh, life brings opportunities around again, um, because I'm now at Atlassian, and one of my top jobs is, is creating this uh, bus terminal for research. Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, so, okay. So, so big takeaway there for you in that was that this, I mean, in short, this data actually isn't really data. It's a, it's a story that people pick up, carry things happen to it changes. It's interpreted differently. And then it, you know, that, that story evolves and, and, and that's what, and that's what researchers are really trying to do. That's kind of what I took away from that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, you know, each research project has a slightly different context. And, you know, unless it's, it's um, for instance, like, uh, you know, a, a team doing sprints and rapid research, and they're um, constantly kind of working on one product that they're iterating and testing every two weeks in the lab or kind of wherever, that becomes like a continuous story where they're wanting to see from the beginning we had this um, product and we've made these changes and therefore this is how the story has shifted over time. Um, so there's that kind of story yeah. arc that's changing. But there's also what kind of research have we done about kind of... Uh, uh, that's funny. Someone I spoke to the other day used this example, so I'll jump on it again. Cat lovers who use Jira, <laughs> right? Stranger one. You know, what do we know about those those people? And um, what have we learned about them? And, and how can I bring that knowledge into the research that I'm doing that might be about something completely different? Um, but, you know, these are kind of ideas I'm still forming at the moment. Um, and, and certainly it's interesting because I've heard a little bit more looking at what other people are saying about repos, this idea of it being not being a library, but a place where uh, intersection happens between people doing research. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that that's, uh, I think that's very insightful because a, a research library in many ways already exists. And there's people, I mean, we certainly find this with the work that we do here at Aurelius, but uh, there's already people hacking, to, you know, existing tools to do that. Um, and the reason those we find aren't successful is, is because of, I, I think, I suspect the very insight that you just shared, which is, um, that they're that they're static and there's not much that you're, you're doing and sort of reusing with that, right? It's not allowing it to be a story or a collection of pieces to construct your own story, maybe in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Interesting. And, uh, and you talked about the relatively rapid growth. I would certainly think so, particularly given we, ha we are a fairly niche community, right? Uh, as researchers. And, you know, the biggest thing I wanted to ask about that is, what are people coming to the research ops community looking for? Mm. So it's very interesting because uh, also when I first started the community, um, and it is something that we, we're going back to, um, I really thought it would be people who uh, were sort of looking for people who are actually doing the research operations role in the world, of which there are very few, but they do exist. Um, Lucy at Spotify, for instance, is is a, is a great example. And uh, the kind of more and more are, are coming up and I hear of more and more roles being made. Um, it's just a, you know, this is a sidetrack, so pull me back to your question if I leave it. But um, one of the kind of primary reasons that I, I, once I started the community and I realized, oh, there's like some traction here. And, and one of the reasons that I started it was I want to validate this as a thing in the world because so many researchers need the help and they're not getting it because it's difficult to get the budget for something that doesn't exist. 
And if we can make it big enough and validate it, then it's so much easier for someone to go to their head of or their whoever, MD, whatever the story might be, and say, hey, uh, you know, like Uber's got this or so-and-so's got this or this big company's got this. And there's this whole movement and there's this thing. And, and you know, to be able to lean on that and get budget and space for, for that role, it, it just becomes so much easier. Um, so this is where I realized I was going to forget your original question. <laughs> uh, the original question was, what are people coming to the research ops community looking yes. for? Yes. Thank you. So in validating that role, a lot of people are coming to find out what is it? Like, what is research operations, right? But those people coming are not necessarily, they're not like 99% of people in the community are researchers. They're not research operations people. Um, and they're interested in research operations because it's like, if you have someone come to you and you say, you know, all those stones in your shoe that you feel are slowing you down and, and creating blisters, well, I'm here to remove them. Of course, they're going to come and, and A, be very interested in what you're doing and, and how you're going to remove them. But at the same time, then we've also asked, you know, a whole lot of researchers gathered, like sort of a thousand more now of researchers have gathered. And as a research operations per a person, I think, fantastic. These, this is my clientele, right? These are eventually my users. And there's like now many, many of them here who are very keen to tell us what they want. and so. Um, I think this became really interesting for people where it's like someone is addressing this need for support and researchers need it. It's being validated as an industry and we are want to be a part of that because we want that too. And I'm asking uh, researchers, what do you want from research operations? What does it mean to you? Um, and I mean, I just think all of that is very um, enticing and that's not to say that i've been like specifically hanging carrots mm -hmm. out for researchers i've not been strategic about that but um that's sort of when i think back over it i think yeah well now it makes sense you know it makes sense that a lot of people are interested in the conversation um i just one more thing i would add is that i think what's interesting is that the community itself has become um a lot of the conversation in the community is around methodology, uh, research methodology, um, which is not research operations, right? But um, it's just become a very strong community of, of researchers, and that's a, a great thing. Uh, over time, uh, we've you know we're running town halls and doing various things, um, which will kind of curate the conversation towards research ops more and more. And I think as the practice and the industry around research operations grows, and we've just got more people who are doing the role. Um, I think that side of the conversation can be much more rich as well because research operations tend to talk about different things. Mm, I love it. Okay, so one of the one of the things you mentioned in your answer, Kate, are people come to the community simply to answer the question, "What is it?" So I'm going to address the elephant in the room: What <laughs> is research ops? Understanding, of course, yeah, that there's sure. no right or wrong answers, and we're not drawing a line in the sand, but. I have to ask the instigator, <laughs> what is research ops? Yeah, sure. So it's it's interesting because um, if, uh, we have this uh, global initiative now called hashtag what is research ops. And uh, when the community, I think in the first two weeks when, when I saw, oh, wow, you know, there's actually kind of 300 people here in, in uh, I better buy more beer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I realized, you know, even with 300 people, there's enough for us. That's a really good sample size for really figuring this thing out and what a researchers want from research operations. And at that point, a, a kind of a core team of people had gathered around just because they were really kind of interested. And, and uh, this is what is now like mostly the, the board behind uh, what we call B board reops. We've got lots of cheesy mm -hmm. names for things. Um, but we, we had a chat of super like really in, like smart, smart people. And so um, we had a chat about this and, and, and I said, well, I feel like we should really kind of tackle what is research ops for researchers. And, and we spoke about and decided to run, at the, initially in March, we decided we'd run five workshops around the world. And it was very important to me that from day one, we were global. Um, I knew that um, if I let it be, the conversation probably would have remained as an American-European conversation, uh, which felt like a really a lost opportunity considering the web is worldwide. Um, and so I went out of my way to go and find people in India and in Australia and in Africa and in, in all sorts of different places so that the conversation we had would be global too. I was interested in researchers around the world and that diversity. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to run five workshops 
in various locations. Um, but, you know, uh, it took off again more than expected. And now we have 32 workshops in kind of many corners of the world, except for we've only had one in Africa and none in South America, but pretty much everywhere else we've got coverage, including Japan and Russia. And there's people coming up now from potentially Poland and New Zealand and uh, gosh, uh, China, India, you name it. There's There's been um, pretty much on every continent except for South America, there's been a mm -hmm. workshop. And these workshops have been sometimes small, sometimes big, with researchers to ask questions. What are the challenges you experience in your life as a researcher? What are your triumphs? Like, what are the things that went great for you? And what do you think research operations is? So to go back to the mm -hmm. elephant in the room, why I give you that whole story before I answer your question straight, is that um, I've sort of been avoiding giving my interpretation of it before the community has, that research has come out. But I do, for sure, I mean, obviously, I'm an opinionated enough person <laughs> to have my own opinion on it. I'm learning um, also, you know, like working with Lisa as the head of Research Insights, there are elements that are um, like methodology and uh, strategy and research craft that is very much a head of research type thing. And I need to dovetail with all of that stuff going on, all this kind of the, the wonderful things that Lisa is looking at, we need to change and hone and work on. And saying, how do I bring the structure in underneath all of those things so that they, they work, right? So if we want to do a training thing, I'm looking at how does the training work? What is the format? What are the, you know, how do people sign up? What are all the operational pieces behind the strategy, the research strategy? Um, so, you know, part of what is research ops is getting together a framework. So we've got not just recruitment, right, which is most people's kind of what is research ops, recruitment and procurement. In my opinion, yes, recruitment is core. It has to be done well. Procurement is not a part of research operations, right? Procurement and, and, and information security, they, for me, are things that are strands that run through everything you do in an organization. They're not elements on their own. But you can look at things like uh, training and career development uh, for your team. Uh, you can look at organizing all the offsites and those sorts of things, just kind of event management. Uh, you look at travel arrangements, you look at, um, you know, if you're working in a situation where researchers are going out and doing challenging research, they're speaking to homeless people mm -hmm. or um, abused people or whatever the case may be, um, they need to have possibly quick access to counselors. Um, and if that's your situation as an operations space, you need to make sure you've, you've worked that process out. So when a researcher has, is doing challenging research and they need some offload time, you're not going, I need to figure that one out and go and procure and wait five weeks um, while I get that thing right. Um, these are the kinds of things that sit within the remit. But as we're kind of forming the practice and as I'm kind of practicing the practice <laughs> at Atlassian, I, I think, you know, as you said, it's not a line in the sand. There's, you know, there's, there's the landscape's going to shift, which is really exciting. Sure, sure. There's one thing that you said there I want to make sure I clarify too. When you mentioned procurement, what specifically do you mean? Yeah, so I hear a lot of um, the time people saying, oh, you know, like procurement is a research operations thing. Um, you know, the buying of stuff and mm -hmm. the arranging of buying of stuff. And for me, you know, whatever move you make in an organization, you're going to need to work with procurement, right? If you want to, any kind of vendor or tool. I mean, everybody has to deal with procurement at some point in the organization. It's not specifically a research operations thing. In recruitment, there is procurement. You need to pay people for the recruiting they did um, or their incentives, right? Uh, if you're looking at a vendor list, that has got a procurement element in it uh, and so on and so forth. And very similarly with um, information security and looking around uh, privacy, uh, every bit of research just about has a privacy element to it mm. it's just kind of part and parcel of of pretty much everything you're going to do so it's not an, in to my mind they're not like elements yeah that's very fair and i appreciate the clarification um you know it, it makes me it reminds me of a recent thought i've had because uh given our given what we do at Aurelius, obviously we're pretty involved in in these kind of conversations about design ops and research ops and things like this and as i've spoken with some people uh i've been met with a certain pause or even resistance to these terms design ops and research ops mm -hmm. and without going into details why 
usually the way I, at least recently, the way I've been trying to mitigate those, this apprehension about this idea of design ops or research ops uh, is something that I've said actually for a very long time, which is design is a business. And like any other business, if you cannot operate efficiently, your business or your product dies. And so if you, if you think about the translation of that as you know, design is a business, which means it's a business within a business, if you can't deliver the value of design and research efficiently, uh, and particularly like your case at scale, the business stops buying those products. They stop buying design and research and they stop investing in it. And then that mm -hmm. practice dies and is no longer able to positively impact um, the things in the lives that we want to with that. So I uh, just wanted to share that. It was an interesting thought for me. That's the way that I try to I try to kind of get people on board because you have to operate efficiently as a business. I would argue you have to operate efficiently, in fact, at any scale, uh, as a design or research practice. 100%. I think there's, there's two things in there. Um, the one is um, it's not – it's like shouldn't be a surprise that these things are happening because – as uh, you know, technology is now ubiquitous. Uh, in two thousand and 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 four, when I when I got into tech, you know, like you would sit on a train or a bus and you wouldn't hear a single person talk about, or even in you know two thousand and eight content strategy, and it wasn't four or five years later where on the on the commute home you would hear just about everybody and his dog around you, <laughs> kind of talking about content strategy or marketing, digital marketing or something like that. And the landscape has changed so quickly, and so as in-house teams um, have grown. Um, you know, it's not unusual now to see a team of ten researchers in a, in a in a in a significant organization, up to fifty or even in the hundreds. Hmm. They they obviously need operations. This is you know, it shouldn't be a surprise. So, I, I totally agree with you. And people saying, oh, you know, ops this, ops that. Well, it's like yes, the industry is at a point now where we can't just be these rogue teams running around um, trying to get stuff done. We need to. We're big enough now that we need to have someone kind of putting in the structure and underpinning stuff so that we can do our best work, so that researchers mm -hmm. aren't worried about vendors and and recruitment and all these kinds of bits of logistical things that nest, that in a in a, a bigger setting hold them back from just getting on with doing research. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, we've got a team here who, because we don't have the structures in place yet, are spending a lot of their valuable brain time on operational things, on on finding vendors to to help them do their work, um, and of course, I'm I'm having conversations to learn about their problems and how in the future we can make those go away, <laughs> so they could just get on with doing their research. Mm -hmm. There was something else that 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 um, I think is really interesting, um, which comes out of that, and uh, some this is like my next kind of big passion with this community is what it, what tends to happen now is great we've validated i've seen you know i get messages weekly to say and and i tend to forget like i think i don't know sometimes i forget why i'm doing this right mm -hmm. um so these conversations are really helpful but also i um i get emails weekly from people to say oh you know just this community has helped me so much because i've been able to get a hire mm. uh and or my Senior is actually now listening to me because I pointed to this community and the, the hashtag, and uh, there's a massive conversation there. And so we've done that work of validating, and I'm just kind of amazed at how easy and quick that was. I mean, not without significant effort, but uh, it, it happened very quickly. It's not been a, a fight at all. Um, but the next thing is what's what's happening is that people are like, oh, well, now we, we must get an operations person. And they hire in some poor soul who <laughs> is expected to look after the problems of an entire team of researchers and solve all of them. And I think where the understanding needs to change um, is that recruitment businesses, they run as businesses in the outside world. And you have two, three, I mean, you know this very well as a business, you, know, you have at least two people, three people running the business as a full-time effort. And a lot of money and resources go into running it, and it needs to make money. Otherwise, it, it, it fails. And so hiring, you know, you look at, at research operations, and there's potentially, you know, up to 12 businesses in there, certainly six. Recruitment's a business. Uh, travel booking, unless you've got it built into your organization, is a business. Uh, a library or a bus stop, you know, a bus terminal is a business, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, training organization is a business. An event organization is, is a business. A PR company a publishing house, these are all independent businesses that need somebody 
pretty much full time to run them, depending mm -hmm. on the size and context that you're in, mm -hmm. or the size of the organization. And so hiring in one person and expecting them, first of all, to have the strategy to be able to set up up to six businesses and then be able to oversee them and then run them as, you know, like I'm going to actually do the recruitment and the editing and the publishing and the bus terminal. It's just very, you know, it's just not viable. And so I'm hoping in time that, you know, I don't expect any of this to happen immediately, even here at Atlassian, I, you know, I, I've, um, I know over time and everybody knows that I'll need to build up a team around internal businesses, but obviously I'm not going to get kind of, hey, here's six positions and hire them in today. Um, so it takes time. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a ton of sense. And um, I mean, selfishly, I, I'm very pleased that you that you get on with my business design as a business example, because I don't I, I, I've, I've found opposition to that, too. But I love the examples that you shared of, well, there are these things, these supporting operational type roles that operate as independent businesses, not even in your own company to support the work you do. There's a reason yeah. there is a a profitable business around those things, right? Uh, to support you in doing your work. And through all of this, because uh, we kind of touched on this as well, Kate, I want to ask, when should somebody be concerned? When should they start thinking about doing research ops? Right. It's a very good question. Um, you know, this is a bit of a thumbsuck answer. Uh, it isn't, it isn't in the sense that... Um, I have noticed over the last um, six, seven years that really teams of 10 start to feel the pressure. Um, so is this a team of 10 at the entire company or a design team? Like a design, a research team. Got it. You know, like a team of 10 researchers starts to feel, feel the pressure. But, you know, um, it's interesting because as a consultant, my context was always kind of working with a research team. And going and delivering a tactic, a lab or a panel or a this or a that, or looking at data security, um, which is another fascinating kind of world in, in research terms. Um, and I didn't ever really have to kind of step out of my immediate team as a consultant. And what I'm really enjoying here at Atlassian is that because I'm here for the long term and I'm getting to kind of spread my wings really wide and kind of get to know broad parts of the organization, We've got a core research team, but we've also got what I call people doing research mm. Uh, mm. across the organization. And so my remit, uh, you know, sort of, I love it when you come in and, and it's like this rum, rum cell belled in thing where you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, and it's just this fantastic thing when things are revealed to you that you didn't even know that you'd missed out on. And one was that like, oh, my gosh, like my clientele is is my research that the research team I'm in, which is growing all the time. Um, I don't even know how many people we are anymore because every week we, you know, so someone new arrives. Fantastic. Um, but there's all these people doing research across the organization. Um, and if we're going to keep doing research, they need to be, I need to empower them to do better research and, and to understand more about research. And this is, again, going back to where I dovetail with, with research strategy and research methodology in that the methodologists, the head of research and the advisors and those kinds of things are looking at how do we upscale our craft? And I'm looking and going, how do I provide the implements that you are needing to do that? Mm -hmm. um, I think I've forgotten your original question again. I'm always going down little alleyways in my head. What was a, it? It was just a matter of when should you do research ops? Yes. Yeah. So I said 10 people, right? And now I look at it and I think, well, you know, the borders of that are very hazy. Mm -hmm. Because you might have like a very small, like you might have one person who's the researcher, but there's a lot of people doing research across the organization. And then on top of that, there's, uh, you know, the executives or the senior PMs, whoever, or, who are looking for data and, and they become your clientele too. So mm -hmm. I think it becomes much more around how big is research in your organization? Yeah. And how much research is going on as opposed to kind of size, you know, team numbers. Mm-hmm. That's that's fair. It's very fair. You something you said there, Kate, reminded me of one of our most recent guests, Dave Malouf, who mm -hmm. is a, a design operations consultant. And one of the things he said uh, when he was on our show is that your design ops happens whether you're intentional about it or not. I'm curious to get your reaction on that. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, you know, if people have got piles of books, someone will build a bookshelf at some point. 
And whether they've built it in the right place or uh, the right size is beside the point, right? It could be a few planks of wood and a stack of bricks. Um, it will get built. And, you know, it's it's really interesting. And I'm sure anyone who's going into a research operations role is probably going to be nodding their head at this because you come into a space where people have done their best uh, kind of amongst everything else they're doing and potentially you know, not, not as... Uh, you know, not people who are necessarily operations people or strategists or just love to organize the world. Um, and you've got sometimes really nice bookshelves, but other times like bricks and planks of wood, right? Or the floor. And, yeah, or just stuff on the floor. And, the you know, that's been the version of operations. And, and you come into that space and it's not just clean cut like, oi, I'm here and I'm going to sort out everything that you've not been doing because it has been getting done. It's it's a matter of slowly dipping into areas and going, okay, so this bookshelf is actually pretty nice. Um, we might just leave that one there for the moment, but that bookshelf, you know, or that lack of bookshelf over there really needs to be sorted out. Mm -hmm. And you find that people also own that bookshelf. It's not yours just to pick up and take away or dismantle. Mm -hmm. um, you've now got someone who's, they've been tending to that bookshelf for quite a while now. <laughs> And uh, it would be very rude just to go in there and dismantle it and say, well, it's rubbish and I'm going to give you a new one. Mm -hmm. So um, you kind of come into a research operations role and need to um, take a little bit of time and just getting to understand what already exists and what, which, which, you know, what's working, what's not working, who owns what, and, and slowly how you move those things onto your agenda um, yeah. because they have been pre-owned. Yeah, uh, that's... Uh... That's a wonderful analogy too. And just continuing with the bookshelf example, <laughs> you know, in some cases I, I suspect you walk in and it's education that, well, did you know that you have a bookshelf, whether or not you call it that? Um, yeah. And so let's, let's talk about what a good bookshelf is. And here's other <laughs> examples of bookshelves that, <laughs> that you might want to mimic or, or, or steal from, you know? Um, because when, so when Dave actually shared that, that quote, uh, when he was a guest on our show, one of the things that made me think of is is the old saying that we've always had about experience design, which is, you know, your customers are going to have an experience whether or not you design for it. Mm. Your chance of success increases, of course, the more, you know, time, energy, and focus you place on that. I would suspect the analog is true, right, with research ops or design ops in this case. Yeah. Uh, gosh, it's quite funny on that one because I can only disagree. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why they pay uh, me the big bucks, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's going to happen whether you design for it or not. Mm -hmm. That is exactly it. And uh, boy, it's a, it's a, there's so many bookshelves in research operations. Uh, um, it's kind of interesting because when you're coming in and, and researchers are like, oh my God, you've arrived. <laughs> Uh, we can't wait for you to fix up our entire world. And you're going, yeah, at the moment, it's just me. And uh, you, you need to kind of pace yourself on things. But um, and, and also just be accepting that other things are going to get designed. Just, you know, like make make do, <laughs> you know, yeah. let's just make do with what we've got right now. And, and that's OK. Yeah, I think that that's that's being pragmatic. And I think that that's what we always have to do. And it's what's taken us this far to reach an acknowledgement and level of maturity to see, well, let's crystallize this this realm of research ops and even experience design in many ways. Yeah. So, so Kate, we covered a lot of ground over a short period of time. Uh, and that's a great thing, but I, I realize we're coming up towards the end of our time together and I need to be respectful of that for you, despite the fact that I'm quite sure we can talk for several more hours about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in light of that, I'm going to ask one final question before we sort of wrap it up, which is, if I if if I had a bookshelf fall on my head and I forgot everything that we discussed uh, over the course of our time here, what would be the big takeaway you want folks to remember from our conversation? Hmm. So, um, you know, this is sort of related and uh, or, or like as usual with me, so, so off to the side a little bit. I think one of the big things is is one of the wonderful things I've learned from the community is that we don't need to work in these little silos of like, I'm in my company or I'm in my country or I'm in my little kind of space over here. It's really about opening up conversations and conversations become much richer and more strong when you're making the effort to reach across the globe and connect with people. And it's just been an immense experience and I've made friends and a lot of people, I've heard of people going to other people's birthday parties now that they met in the community. And I've made friends with people who have... Um, 
I've met around the world. For instance, Johnny in Japan, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is such a great way. Johnny in Japan, he was in Sydney the other day and we met for tea and it was just, you know, it's a great person to meet. Um, or, you know, like friends that I've got around the world who I'll just have a phone conversation with now uh, mm -hmm. about just their lives in general. And this really becomes for me important because it's a community with a capital C and anyone who knows will know that I always spell it with a capital C because it's a community of people that are getting to know one another that are sharing openly. It just goes back to that humanity thing of um, uh, the whole reason this started was because I spent time with people who I saw were having a hard time with things. And so we're creating something to try and lift that weight off them so they can have a happy time with things and do the work that they love. And uh, a whole lot of like control freak operations, people like me around the world can do what they love by providing the space with the researchers. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's always this thing where I feel like it just really that boils back down to people and 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 taking care of each other. And, and that might sound kind of cheesy to a lot of people, but um, I think that's that's what I would share. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Uh, it all comes back down to people. Yes. Yes. That's what, and it is. That's, that's what research is all about. Yeah. People, not pixels. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kate. Um, I love it. This has been an extremely fun chat for me, and I'm quite sure that those listening are going to get a ton out of it. Um, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you'd like to share with folks that are listening today? Sure. So there are a few things. If you'd like to join the research ops community, we have a Slack uh, which is the thousand kind of plus members. Um, there is a, a form which um, possibly you can share in your notes um, that you can fill out. We we add people once a month. Uh, it's a wait list, and um, we have a Twitter account. It's at Team Reops. Um, and we have town halls, which are open to anyone. Um, you don't have to be in the Slack community. Um, and again, uh, we can share the form for that. You just fill out a form and I'll add you to a Google group. And once a month, someone in the world runs a town hall. Uh, we just started them, but the plan is that every single month, someone who's in the kind of core uh, organizational community, the team reops will run um, a, a, a town hall with people speaking about research ops type things. Um, those are the main things. Otherwise, I'm talking at UX Brighton in November, early November in, in the UK, and sharing all the results that we've got from the What is Research Ops research, and um, or at least the results we've got for now, that there's so much data. Um, I'm doing a workshop, which is currently sold out at Design Ops, on a, a research ops strategy and how to put that together. That's great. Well, we'll make sure we have links to all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, Kate, this has been a fantastic chat. And uh, I just want to say thank you again for taking your time. It's my absolute pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Awesome. All right, everybody. We will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also, you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to the Aurelius Podcast, the show where we talk with brilliant minds about user research, UX design, and building great products that meet the needs of real people and what you learned about them. Aurelius is a user research and insights tool for design and product teams. Aurelius helps you add, tag, organize, search, and share all of your user research notes and customer feedback insights to figure out what you learned faster and easier than ever before so you can make awesome designs, products, and features. Check us out for a free trial at AureliusLab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Or find us on Twitter at AureliusLab. We'll see you next time.